I am going to be talking about some work that I did in my thesis with Gonzalo Girobet, looking at uh, a group of harvestmen from New Zealand, the genera Sorensenella and Karamea. Whoa, too far. There we go. These uh, genera are part of the family Trinidicidae, and this has a temperate Gondwanan distribution. It's found in all the places in red on the map here. And just as a sidebar, if you're interested in learning more about the family Trinidicidae, there have been some changes to it recently, uh, you should listen to Shahan's talk in half an hour. Getting back to it, Sorensenella and Karamea were historically grouped in the subfamily Sorensenellinae, along with two genera from South Africa, Lorencella and Speleomontia. And this was based on the shape of their tarsal claws. But from our recent work on the family, we now know that Karamea and Sorensenella are part of a larger clade of trinonychids that are restricted to New Zealand and New Caledonia. And this clade has been diversifying since the late Cretaceous, before New Zealand separated from the rest of Eastern Gondwana. Sorensenella and Karamea themselves are sister genera, and they're broadly distributed across New Zealand. Karamea is found in the west coast of the South Island of New Zealand, and Sorensenella is predominantly on the North Island, though it does have a couple of subspecies in the South Island as well. And I was interested in working on this group for a number of reasons. They have some interesting natural history. They are the only lineage within Trinonychidae and indeed all of Insidiatories that is known to exhibit paternal care of their eggs. And they are quite charismatic. They can be up to a centimeter in length. They're covered in spines. And the two genera can be easily differentiated from one another by the shape of their ocularium. In Karamea, the spine on the ocularium is angled forward, and in Sorensenella, it points straight up. But apart from those diagnostic characters at the generic level, the taxonomy within this group is very unsettled. No one has worked on it since Forster in 1954, and while there are a number of named species and subspecies, these have never been tested in a phylogenetic framework using either morphology or molecular characters. In addition, uh, there are a number of subspecies that were erected on the basis of gravarian characters like tarsimere number, things that we now know aren't great predictors of evolutionary relatedness. To make matters more complicated, both genera are known to exhibit sexual dimorphism. And this is most evident in their palps. In males, the pedipalpal femur is greatly widened, while in females, they're much more slender. However, one of the described species of Sorensenella, Sorensenella rotara, is known only from females. So given the dimorphism in the group, this was a little bit suspect, and I wanted to undertake a revision of the group. To do that, I used ultra-conserved element or UCE sequencing. There have been a number of talks on UCEs uh, in this Congress already, so apologies if this is redundant, but uh, UCEs are regions of genomic DNA that are highly conserved across a clade of interest. And as you move out from that core region, the base pairs become more and more variable. And that sequence variation can then be used for phylogenetic inference. And you can trim these flanking regions more or less conservatively to resolve relationships at a variety of taxonomic scales. So in this project, I sequenced samples with the Arachnida probe set from Starrett et al. And I processed these samples with Phyluche. My sampling was able to cover nearly all of the described morphospecies and subspecies. And I used very lenient, lenient trimming parameters in the flanking regions because I was interested in resolving a shallower set of taxonomic relationships. And in the end, I had 854 loci in my 50% taxon occupancy matrix. And generally speaking, all individuals were well represented in the matrices. And then uh, additionally, I pulled out SNPs from the UCE loci so that I could use them in species delimitation analyses 
And I also used them to generate some population genetic uh, statistics for those constituent species. Using the UCE loci themselves, I ran a bunch of different phylogenetic analyses. These used different uh, tree reconstruction methods, and I had a variety of matrices that allowed for variable taxon occupancy. I had a matrix in which I excluded loci that were uh, compositionally heterogeneous, and I had a matrix where I excluded loci that were uh, extremely fast or slow in their evolutionary rates. And in the end, I recovered a resolved and well-supported phylogeny. Everywhere that you see a small black square here indicates that that node was recovered with full support in every analysis that I ran. The genera themselves are reciprocally monophyletic with full support, which is great. There was one place in the tree where the results conflicted across analyses, but an approximately unbiased topology test found that the tree shown here was significantly better than the alternative topology. And there are a number of very interesting stories contained within this tree. The group as a whole contains signatures of essentially every single major geologic and climatic event in New Zealand's history. This includes the Oligocene drowning and the uplift of the Southern Alps. Um, but for the sake of time for the rest of the talk, I am going to focus on just the results in the North Island Sorensenella and in particular on this species in pink here, Sorensenella rotara. All right, uh, as I mentioned before, I wanted to more objectively delimit the species in this group. So I ran three different species delimitation methods on my SNP data. And one of these was structure. What this program does is it identifies the optimal number of clusters in your sequence data. So you don't have to assign samples to species a priori. And it can also identify genetic admixture between those different groups. So if you're unfamiliar with looking at these plots, each row here is an individual that was sequenced and the different colors indicate a cluster identified by structure, which in this case is a species. Structure found that there were eight species of Sorensenella across the North Island of New Zealand, but only three of these corresponded to described species or subspecies. And I should say that the results of structure were completely corroborated by the two other delimitation methods that I ran as well as morphology. All right. And everywhere that you see a row that has more than one color in it, that means that that sample had SNPs associated with more than one species. But for the most part, all individuals have only one color, which suggests that there's almost no admixture between the different species groups. And taken together, it indicates that Forster's subspecies deserve to be elevated to the status of full species. All right. I want to draw your attention to Sorensenella rotar, though, because something interesting is going on in this species. When compared to other Sorensenella species, for which I had more than one individual sequenced in my uh, study here, it had the lowest observed heterozygosity and the highest inbreeding coefficient value. This should indicate extremely high levels of isolation and inbreeding in the species, which is unusual for a species that has such a broad geographic range. And in fact, its known geographic range is quite a bit wider than what I was able to include in this study, it covers a linear transect of over 400 kilometers. And if you might remember from the beginning of the talk, this species is known only from females. So, the complete lack of males, the extremely low genetic diversity, and its widespread geographic range all point to this species being parthenogenetic. Now, parthenogenesis is a known phenomenon in Opiliones. There are a handful of examples, including uh, Lyobunin. There are two species in northern Japan that are facultatively parthenogenetic. Uh, there is uh, Acropsopilio, where a couple of species are believed to be parthenogenetic. And uh, Megabunus from the European Alps also has a couple of species that are parthenogenetic. But this is the first report of parthenogenesis in the Trinonychids. And to my knowledge, at least, this is the first report of parthenogenesis in Laniatories as a whole. Um, though if 
people know examples, I would love to hear them. Uh, interestingly, Megabunus is believed to have evolved parthenogenesis in response to Pleistocene glaciation. The idea being that uh, by reproducing asexually, those lineages were able to uh, spread out and colonize newly available habitats faster after glacial periods. And I think something similar could be going on in Sorensenella rotara. Uh, here is a map of its distribution. It covers the central and southern portions of the North Island. And based on a CO1 substitution rate divergence dating analysis that I ran, uh, I've estimated that the species started diversifying about 1.2 million years ago in the Pleistocene. And during this period, a marine seaway was starting to recede from this region of the North Island of New Zealand. And during the Pleistocene, after the uh, recession of the seaway, this area is reconstructed as being shrubland grassland habitat. So it seems possible that Sorrentinella rotara, by evolving parthenogenesis, was able to more quickly establish populations in these newly available habitats, uh, which could explain its very large range and yet low genetic diversity. So just to sum up, I was able to use UCE sequencing data to resolve species and uh, generic relationships in this group with high support. I found evidence for multiple undescribed species of Sorensenella and Karamea, and I'm currently working on describing those new species. Um, and part of this work is uh, trying to incorporate UCE sequence data from the types themselves. The diversification dynamics of the group uh, strongly reflect the history of New Zealand. And uh, finally, Sorensenella rotara seems to be a parthenogenetic species, which seems to be novel in laniatories. And this may have been a response to Pleistocene era sea level and glaciation changes. And with that, I would like to thank a lot of people, everyone in the Jirabet lab, especially Shahan, couldn't have done this project without you. Um, people who have generated specimens, uh, the New Zealand Department of Conservation for letting us collect all over, and my funding sources.